All right, I hope you guys are doing well in quarantine. Everyone is staying pretty sane, safe, and healthy. Um, hopefully this COVID thing starts to flatten the curve and everyone stays good. Our healthcare systems don't get uh, too overwhelmed and uh, not too many doctors get sick because this is a mess right now. Uh, so again, good vibes to everyone. Good thank you to all the healthcare workers that are on the front lines. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today was a paper the bidirectional gut brain microbiota axis has a potential nexus between traumatic brain injury, inflammation, and disease. Um, so this was a paper that I downloaded shortly after it was published when I was in school. And then I didn't remember to look at it until I was going through the CCMI course with complete concussions. Um, and they brought up this paper several times. So I was like, you know, I should dive into it. Um, and the cool takeaway is that even in quarantine, uh, as a naturopathic doctor, I can help you uh, overcome concussion symptoms and promote a healthy long-term recovery. So what this basically looked at was that it's not set in stone. So this is very much a theoretical model. I'm going to show you a pretty picture that summarizes uh, picture here that summarizes their model. But the idea is that what goes on in our gut affects our brain. What goes on in our brain affects our gut, and our gut, by and large, so the, the gut is the largest thing that's exposed to the outside world. Um, we have more surface area within our gut than we do have surface area of our skin. And everything we eat and everything we swallow and um, essentially everything we get exposed to goes through our gut first. So the gut is this huge immune reservoir. We have like 70% of our immune system there. We've got the gut and the malt. Um, and the enteric nervous system. And we, the gut is just this cool little entity in and of itself within our body. And I didn't even mention the microbiome. The microbiome is this vast entity within our gut as well um, that all plays a role in how we feel. So um, we've got evidence that microbiome changes occur in autism and depression and obesity and all these different scenarios. Uh, the gut typically you can find a, a way that the gut is involved in most conditions. And so what this paper was looking at is how does TBI, whether that's a mild TBI like a concussion, or whether that's a more moderate or severe TBI, uh, like a blast injury or a severe car accident or some severe head trauma, and how do those systems relate and can we intervene um, in a way that if we intervene uh, top down, so if we intervene at the nervous system level, can we influence the gut? And if we inter intervene at the bottom up level, if we intervene at the gut, can we influence the nervous system? And the answer is probably, um, with a lot of research, probably. Um, so let's go through the model here quick. So if you look at the top right, you've got the primary injury mechanism. So you get hit in the head. The microglia become primed following mechanical injury. So within your brain, so the microglia become primed. So the microglia are these cells within your brain. So you think of the nervous system, you think of nerves, and nerves are composed of little cells called neurons, and neurons are what actually communicate. They're what transmit the electrical signals all throughout your body. But for every single neuron you have in your, brain, in your nervous system, you've got 10 glial cells. And glial cells are sort of helper cells. They're the glue that holds everything together. They create your blood-brain barrier, they regulate electrolytes, and these microglia are a specific type of glial cell that act as sort of the immune system within your brain. So after a head injury, your microglia, microglia become primed. Structural and functional damage to the gut tissue occurs, and neurotrauma induces increased intestinal permeability. So this neurotrauma induces in increased intestinal permeability. We've seen in, uh, they reference it all throughout this paper, but um, particularly mice studies and other studies have shown that within three hours after a head injury, your gut becomes leaky. So that's an increased permeability, it becomes leaky. And when it's leaky, we can let in antigens, we can let in, um, I shouldn't say that word, we can let in pathogens and bad things, um, antigens, things that can trigger our immune system to promote inflammation. And so that's where you'll see people start to react to certain foods after um, a head injury, which I'm gonna show you here. Um, I've got evidence because I've played hockey, several concussions throughout my career, um, never tested food sensitivities, never really did an elimination, and now I've got evidence that my immune system doesn't like um, certain foods. So I'll go over that in a second. 
But basically, you get hit in the head, microglia become primed, that leads to these structural changes down in the gut, and the gut becomes leaky. So follow that through. Leaky gut, we can alter the microbiome as well um, when we get leaky. So that causes a systemic immune response to intestinal dysfunction, which leads to, we're going up here, pro-inflammatory cytokines peripherally influencing the central nervous system, which then further exacerbates this microglia-mediated persistent neuroinflammation. So there's a lot of big words. Basically, the immune cells of your brain after a head injury become primed to promote inflammation. That causes structural um, integrity issues in the gut and the microbiome, which leads to pro-inflammatory stuff like bad inflammation circulating out in the blood, which makes it its way back up to the brain. So all those pro-inflammatory molecules make their way back up to the brain to further exacerbate these microglia, these immune cells within the brain to promote inflammation, to promote inflammation, to promote inflammation. And so you get this crisscross cycle. And so one of the things the study was looking at is are there things that we can do uh, to, to intervene, to stop that cycle, to promote normal neuronal healing, to promote normal gut healing so that this gut brain axis can exist in a healthy, happy individual for a long time. Um, and the answer is probably yes, we probably can intervene. So what I wanted to show you here is, so we talk about leaky gut. Um, as an ND, so currently during the corona outbreak, uh, US Biotech, this is a lab that uh, I use. I know there's a lot of controversy around IgG testing. I am super aware of IgG testing and the controversy. Um, I was not a huge fan of IgG testing until I saw some clinical results when we look at very overt elevations. Um, so I'll make that a separate video so I don't go into a rant about that. But basically IgG is an immunoglobulin. It's an antibody that's uh, the most abundant antibody in our system. IgE, like Ig elephant, Ig elephant, big problems, anaphylaxis, uh, peanut allergies, shellfish allergies, those types of allergies will kill you. IgG is like acne, brain fog, um, joint pain, the sort of like you can't really link it to anything symptoms. Those can be can be IgG food allergies. Um, I shouldn't say allergies, food intolerances. So we go back to this pretty picture. We get hit in the head and we get these structural changes that lead to leaky gut. And now our gut is, our blood and immune system are now exposed to molecules from food and little proteins and carbohydrates from foods that it wasn't previously exposed to when we had a nice, solid, healthy intestine, right? And so we take blood and we can see for me I didn't like wheat. I didn't like this is to show is that I sustained concussions probably I quit playing hockey competitively in 2012. It is now 2020. So it's been about eight years since I stopped playing competitively and I am still seeing these immune responses to um, foods that I otherwise would not have known. Does that make sense? So we get hit in the head, we get this intestinal permeability. My immune system is now reacting to foods that were otherwise healthy, chickpeas, lentils, uh, almonds, uh, wheat. It's a whole grain, you know? Um, so the big ones that we typically see for people are gluten and dairy. I knew I reacted to dairy because I get I'm almost a mild IgE reaction to dairy, um, but I only started getting reactions to dairy almost like that after... Um, probably about three months after a really big hit in New Mexico. Uh, we were playing New Mexico, the Lobos in Albuquerque. Um, maybe three to four months after that, I went to the gym and I had a whey protein shake afterwards and you would have thought I got stung by, or not even stung by bees, but like I snorted pollen. Like I was just runny, sniffy, eyes watering. I was like, what the hell? Um, and I haven't been able to tolerate dairy since. And so that is a great, for me, it's a great like concrete example of like, oh wow, head injury does affect gut function. So there's that. Um, that's one of the things we can test during this COVID outbreak, US Biotech uh, is doing free drop shipping with prepaid tests. So if you are interested, if you have had a head injury, um, I can hook you up with a drop ship test. I don't upcharge it, I just charge the test at costs. Um, so if you're interested, um, you will pay when I pay for this test. Um, with that, moving on, are there other things we can do to the gut? So if we're looking at gut, um, this whole cycle, if we're looking at can we influence the gut, 
hell yeah, we can influence the gut. We can influence the gut through diet. So I like to remind people that you can supplement half a gram to 12 grams of a supplement a day. You know, 12 grams is a lot. Yeah. So 1800 grams of food versus 12 grams of a supplement. One of these is gonna have a bigger impact on your body, right? So if we look at our food, we wanna look at things that are gonna affect the microbiome. For every cell in your body, you for sure have a little microbial organism and there might be more microbial organisms in you than actual human cells. So one of the things we wanna do is make sure our microbiome is happy. And how do we do that? Through prebiotics and probiotics. Um, if prebiotics don't agree with you, so prebiotics are things like inulin, uh, fiber um, is a prebiotic. If things like that don't sit well with you and you get really bloaty up high in your stomach, you might have some microbes in places where you don't really want them. Um, SIBO is a controversial diagnosis, but that's something we tend to think about if prebiotics don't sit well with you. But prebiotics are fuel. So fiber is fuel for the probiotics, for your microbiome. So having a healthy intake of fruits and vegetables and whole grains, so long as you're not reacting, can be a great way to not only have an anti-inflammatory plant-based diet, but a way to promote normal, good microbial health. Next in that line is actually supplementing with probiotics. So what they found and what they referenced throughout this study is when you supplement with probiotics, you actually help seal up that gut, you help bring back integrity, and you help decrease inflammation. And the way they measured this was through LPS, lipopolysaccharide. And lipopolysaccharide is kind of a standard inflammatory marker. The more LPS you have in your system, the more inflammation you have in your system. And probiotics are able to decrease that. Uh, I'm a growing fan of spore-based probiotics. I know there's different times to use different ones, so don't jump out and buy spore-based probiotics just because I mentioned it. Um, that's just one that I'm interested in right now. Uh, beyond that, we can look at nutrients. We can look at omega-3 fatty acids, particularly DHA, because it makes up a vast component of the fat actually in your brain. Uh, you can look at zinc, magnesium, vitamin D. There's a bunch of like nutritional things that we can do uh, to help your gut, but largely it's gonna come away with eating close to a Mediterranean diet, but very plant-based, lots of healthy fats, lots of lean protein. Um, try to avoid gluten and dairy for most people. Um, if you are gonna eat gluten or dairy, make sure to have whole forms. Don't be eating things out of um, packages like boxes and bags, and if it's processed, it's probably not the best. The closer to real food that you can get, uh, the better. Uh, but trying to be close to Mediterranean, closest to a plant-based diet, you can still have meats and proteins. I'm not saying plant-based in that sense. I'm saying plant-based in that you're eating a shit ton of plants. You want to. Um, beyond that, so what can we do? <coughs> what can we do top down? How can we influence this gut-brain axis by influencing the nervous system? And one of the ways we can do that, one of the biggest players in this gut brain axis is the, the vagus nerve. Probably the next, instead of toss up, microbiome and vagus nerve are both pretty big players. Uh, but we can actually influence the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve drops down your neck and goes all the way down and innervates pretty much everything in your gut. Um, and so we can influence the vagus nerve through meditation and paced breathing. Uh, we can influence the vagus nerve through direct stimulation. And that's what they mentioned here in this paper. Um, there's points along the ears, there's points through the neck. You can hit the, you can hit the vagus nerve through the neck. You're definitely going to hit the phrenic nerve, which is going to change breathing, which is going to hit the vagus nerve. That's like a different loop. Um, but you can trans, uh, transcutaneous stimulation of the vagus nerve through here and here. And one of the ways that I do that in office is with, uh, electrons plus. So we'll slap this plate under your leg or something. And then the charge flows through you into me in the ground. Um, and so we can, not that aggressively, it would probably look more, probably look something like this. So it'd probably be a little bit more of this frequency, uh, kind of again down the front of the neck, just following the vagus nerve as it drops. You can actually hit the diaphragm with this as well. Um, but that's one way that we can we can basically look at, okay, we know the vagal stem, uh, vagus nerve stimulation promotes normal gut integrity, it promotes normal microbiome, it promotes normal digestion, it promotes all kinds of good things. Um, there's a recent study that vagal nerve stimulation in and of itself is anti-inflammatory. Um, 
So by hitting these various pathways, whether we're doing at-home approaches like diet and paced breathing, or whether we're doing in-office approaches like uh, food intolerance testing, supplementation, and vagus stim, there's a ton of different ways that we can attack this gut-brain axis as a way to help you recover from your concussion and prevent long-term problems like depression, like chronic traumatic encephalopathy, uh, which is CTE. And a note on CTE is we need a lot more research on that before we decide that it's related to concussion or before we decide that um, it's as scary of an issue as the media has made it out to be. But regardless, we know that uh, neurodegeneration occurs in a lot of people. Uh, I forget the number. The number we're expecting in the next few decades with Alzheimer's numbers is going to be astronomical. Uh, given people's blood sugars, inactivity levels, and just traditional trends in neurodegeneration anyway. Um, so addressing diet, addressing movement, addressing mindset, getting into the office for different things like this can help kind of just flatten the curve of neurodegeneration, to use a very timely uh, saying. Um, but yeah, one thing we can try to do is slow the, the onset of neurodegeneration, prevent the onset of neurodegeneration in the first place. Um, and this paper gave pretty solid theoretical, um, but pretty solid theoretical evidence that, yeah, we can approach uh, the gut-brain axis through nutrition, supplementation, and vagal nerve stimulation as a way to prophylactically prevent TBI damage and to uh, retroactively treat TBI damage, which is pretty exciting. So if you made it this whole almost 20 minutes, I appreciate you. I hope you stay safe, wash your hands. Uh, remember, physical distance Distancing doesn't mean social distancing. You can still call your mom, you can still call your grandma. Um, speaking of, I should call my grandparents because I heard my grandma is trying to like schedule hair appointments and stuff right now, which she should not be doing. So if you're watching this, grandma, stay home, be safe. Um, yeah, thank you for watching.